um, featuring Alicia Mascarenas and Claire de Vogue. Uh, we're very excited to be here with these two poets who I think um, are both pretty wonderful on their own, but together uh, reading them side by side, it, it makes a really, I think, lovely music. So I'm excited for you all to hear what I've been hearing in my head the last couple of weeks. Um, <clears throat> a little bit about Belladonna. If you don't know, Belladonna is a feminist collaborative um, publishing venture and organization founded in 1999. Um, we run a reading series uh, which uh, publishes and promotes the work of women and LGBTQ plus uh, poets who are working sort of <clears throat> on the margins outside the tradition, turning the tradition upside down, doing exciting things. Um, and to co coincide with basically every reading we do, we publish uh, what we call chaplets, which are short pamphlets, uh, usually of work in progress, sometimes of finished works um, to commemorate the reading. The chaplets that we're launching tonight, I wish I had to show you in my hands, um, but they're, I have to pick them up at the printer tomorrow morning. Um, but they are number 262 and 263 in the series. So it's getting up there. Um, and you can order them from our website belladonnaseries.org slash chaplains. They're $5 each. Um, I encourage you to do that. You can also, if you want, uh, purchase a subscription, which will get you all the chaplets and books that you can require. I keep sending the URL to a private entity. If someone could just, Zoe or Rebecca, could you drop the chaplet URL in the, in the chat? <laughs> I'm incapable. Um, so I uh, am James Loop. I'm the program manager at Belladonna. Um, and I'm going to read a little introduction, which I prepared this afternoon. And then I'm going to turn it over to Alicia, who will read first. And then Ali following sort of directly after Alicia will come Claire. Um, and we've invited our readers to kind of take their time. I think both have prepared somewhere around a set of 20 minutes or so. So you can feel free to relax, let your mind uncoil a little bit um, and really take in what I think is some really exceptionally beautiful poetry. Um, now I shall read my introduction and diminish into the West. Okay. I'm pleased, this is how it begins. I'm pleased that this, also if I could just ask, try and be mindful of, um, your mute button. If you're not um, one of the presenters, try and mute yourself. I, there's no way to say that that doesn't sound harsh, but it just helps with the, <laughs> with the background noise. Um, I'm pleased that this reading, our first of the year and marking nearly a year since we stopped assembling in person is happening in New York, at least, which is where I am in the midst of a thaw. It's pleased me to think of the two works we're publishing tonight, Alicia Mascarenas's Contagion Fields and Claire de Vogue's Apocalypses 1 through 12 as crocus works, which marble the very early and the very late in a way that rings against a time sensation, which has become familiar, I think, to us, standing on our particular weird pin in the time scale of the planet and the species and our lives, very early, very late, flickering. The thaw, the prospect of spring it contains, has been disturbing me today, I think, because I feel there's an iron fact to this winter of mass death, impoverishment, isolation, organized and disorganized pillage, endemic disorientation, which our culture is working frantically as ever upstream to disavow, paper over, plow through, and abandon, to vaccinate itself against. And it feels powerfully wrong to me to move past it. And I want this winter's silence to speak. Alicia's and Claire's poetry in its shared rigor and the exactitude of its address has been speaking to that want for me for the last few weeks. A question, how do we inhabit our time and place with integrity against the dazzling sensory inundations the trillion stimuli, mundane violations 
the legislated amnesia of capitalism, or not inhabit it once and for all, finally, which would be another convenient apocalypse, not make a precious fossil of integrity to be brandished and lorded over others, but to live toward it, not to forget, to edge toward the light, as Alicia writes. Poetry's answer. Amazing, I don't think I've ever listened. I don't think I've ever listened to that one. It's like an Indian thing, but I, yeah, I don't know. I never heard of it before. Someone's mic is on, although it is delightful. Um, just letting you know, I'm not sure whose it is. Uh, poetry's answer, pay attention. Or not, not pay, but practice. Collect the discards, the repressed, the minute, the trash always streaming off us. Arrange it, write it, call it and us to account. Claire writes, some walk before it to draw it as well as they can. Others with the mystery go strange. I am pleased and warmed by the prospect of going strange with the mystery with you all, scattered and gathered tonight. And so let me introduce Alicia Mascarenas. Um, I'd like to read her bio, which has just vanished from my screen. Excuse me one moment. Ah. Alicia Mascarenas is a poet and translator living in Brooklyn, New York. She has contributed writing to publications such as The Poetry Project, Newsletter, Peripheral Review, Entropy, and The Felt, among others. Recent collaborative work for the Project Echo exhibit was presented as part of Lower Manhattan Cultural Council's River to River 2020 for Voices. Alicia holds an MFA in writing from Pratt Institute and is co-editor of Read, 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 a journal of intertranslation. And without further ado, let's welcome Alicia. No cheering. Thanks, James. Um, I'm going to be reading from this chair behind me, but I just, I, I started to feel self-conscious because everyone else was really close up and I was way back there. So I'm going to, I'm going to move back there. It's where my papers are. I'm pretty nervous, um, so I'm gonna try to go slowly. I was like all day, like very like fine and like no problem. And then about half an hour before the reading, so like, oh my God. So try to even that out. Um, it's so nice to see all of you um, and to just know that all of you are here. I wrote um, some introductory notes because I knew that if I didn't, I would just, uh, ramble on and on, so I'm just going to read from my script. Whew. All right. So yeah, I just want to start by saying hi and um, welcome to everyone who's here from all over. I know there are people who are tuning in from many different places. Um, and yeah, tonight I'm in a hotel in Chinatown in New York City, uh, which is right across the river from where I live in Brooklyn. And it's quarter past seven where I am. And I'm just, I'm thinking about being in a space with all of you and the strange phenomena of being with you, but also being in, in different spaces that we're all, you know, encountering day by day in these strange times. And I wish I could ask you directly, but I can't. So I'm just inviting you to ask yourself where you are and who you're with. And I'm wondering also if there's anything that you can do for yourself right now to be more at ease and to be more um, ready to listen. I know sometimes when I tune in to the Zoom space, I can sort of collapse towards the screen. So if there's anything you can do right now to make yourself more comfortable, maybe just like shifting your posture, drinking water. Um, 
Um, yeah, and just, I just, I, yeah, I want to say, like, as you're listening tonight through mine and Claire's readings, just, like, maybe check in with that from time to time. I'm going to try to do the same thing. Um, and I invite you to also really let your attention come in and out. I mean, I can speak for my reading, at least. It's not something that uh, requires full attention. So if you're drifting, um, you know, in and out from the screen, in and out from your space to where you're listening in, that's great. Yeah. I think that's all I want to say about that. So um, I want to say a little bit about what brought this collection of poems um, contagion fields into being. So last year, um, in the early spring months of the pandemic, when we were all shuttered away in our apartments in like the real like deep uh, quarantine and like shelter at home orders. And in New York, I remember really feeling a really strong sense of like death everywhere. And it felt really hard to write. Um, and I know I wasn't alone in that. And at the same time, I also felt this desire to track what I was noticing and what I was experiencing through that time. Um, and I was just really writing out of necessity. Um, so a lot of my writing was really notational and fragmented and just really like a method of tracking. Um, and then partway through into that, time where I was kind of just, you know, taking notes, but nothing was really coming together. Um, my lover, Cobb, who's here with me as well, um, started a, a video series, um, kind of doing a similar thing, but through video of, of what I understood to be observing the, the current situation and what was close to us. Um, just even in the space of our apartment or the sky, um, and after some time, I started, you know, watching these videos and started wanting to respond to them uh, with my writing. And it just kind of came about sort of unintentionally. Um, and then over time, I started just composing these small texts in response to Cubs videos, um, just pulling a still each day from those videos that she was making every day, and then writing something that was kind of um, an assemblage of different notes that I had taken throughout the day. Um, and what felt important was that I was really not trying to make anything good um, or anything that was of particular like worth or quality. I was just, yeah, it just really came out of a necessity, like I said. Um, yeah, there was more I was gonna say about that, but I'm gonna skip it. Um, yeah, and I, I wanna mention too that you know, as you're listening, it's not really a chronological order from, you know, through the seasons, but there are kind of these markers too that you might listen for in terms of the season and what was going on. I think someone's mic was on because I'm hearing some sneezing. Okay. If anyone wants to check in. Yeah. Yeah, so there was the spring and then it, it kind of continued until kind of late summer. Um, yeah, and I also, I, I feel compelled to, to give thanks to a few people um, before I begin reading. There are so many people who I could thank whose, you know, presence and sensibilities has really affected this work. Um, and that's, you know, you know who you are. But it, yeah, it feels necessary for me to, to thank Cub um, because it was Cub's videos and Cub's ways of observing the light and that kind of slow down pace and the really slight movements um, in the beginning of the pandemic that moved me to, to start what became this collaborative project. So, <laughs> um, thank you, Kat. Um, and I want to thank Sarah, who's here with us with her cat and, and her daughter, Layla. Um, Sarah has always encouraged my poetry in really meaningful ways, and also particularly turned me towards Belladonna as a viable home for this collection. So I'm grateful to you for that. Um, and then further along that 
path or that orientation. Rachel, who I think is also here, Rachel Levitsky, also linked me up with James, whom I never met before and who we're kind of meeting face to face for the first time. Um, so I'm just, I'm really thankful for those kind of linkages that happened along the way. And James just received just my this group with such open and open for them, and it was really encouraging. Um, this mic is on again. Come on, get it together. Um, and I want to thank um, my friend Asia, who I think is here as well, and Marcelina and Anna, who I don't think are here, um, just for, for giving their time and attention to this collection of writing as it was coming into being. They all read through it and, and gave me some really helpful and kind feedback. So thank you. And then finally, um, just, you know, I mean, a lot of my friends contributed to making this work possible in different ways, but I really especially want to thank Hoda and Ben, um, who have just been so like loving and supportive and affirming of my writing practice, um, and specifically of this work as it came into being. Thank you too. Um, yeah, and thank you Zoe and Alma, who I think I'm that we're on the organizing side of this tonight. Um, and Claire too, thanks for, for being here and reading alongside me. I'm really excited to hear your work. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna um, also, well, Cub's gonna play a track um, by this sound artist and self-identified vocal demon, uh, Holland Andrews. They're a New York based musician and performer, um, and it's just a drone track. Uh, I think we're going to try to play kind of quiet, um, but if at any point it is too loud or it's doing something weird auditorily, please just like let me know. I'll try to kind of keep an eye to the chat, but I just wanted to bring it in to kind of help carry the words. Last thing I want to say um, is I want to dedicate this reading to my dad. Um, Karma Mascarenas. Uh, he was a musician and a songwriter, and uh, tomorrow morning will uh, mark 20 years since he passed away. So I want to offer this to him. Ready? Okay. Fragility of the season. Contagion fields spreading, dissipating in the atmosphere. A commons being enacted through a virus, a carrier. Exhales across the skin of the planet to lodge behind the eyes of my beloved just there, the ridge beneath the brow bone, that sacred center, locus of insight, of focus, of vision. How the body surfaces from exhaustion, light, agile, sensitive as the spring. Be willing to stay close enough to your suffering to receive its wisdom. Close the door, open the windows, take rest, wait generously. Shisandra, mother ward, and dandelion, the cyclical melancholy. Rose, mimosa, passion flower for daily apprehensions, flourishing intensity. The task is to let each glimmer of strange delight propel you like a seed. Unwind the mediated perception all afternoon with the windows open. Make a soft pressure with the little finger down your throat and swallow. Drag the palm across your automated and 
inclinations, make a fist and let it tremble with your bird. Growling for flowers, flowers, great bouquets of tulips, so pink and bundle. What's underway in the exalted dream hotel with the big sky looking out? Lean out of the window with your hair wet and your fresh slippers on. In the feedback loop, find a pause between sensation and articulation, drum and sigh. Supple as an iris, steady as a sunflower. After dark, tune your antennae to the piano. Its condition is a cruel and unusual score. Bird cries break the dawn. The chronic ache returns. Labor to adjust by moving toward the keys. It slows the mind and begins a tightening procedure. Agitation threatens the surface. From mouth to tail, death feeds life, and breath animates the animal. Do you, ever, uh, do you ever let misguided submission sabotage your access to what you need most? Let interior sensation determine the expression and flicker in the mind's eye. Discern the social economy of your language. Let it open the sensei beyond the sequestered exchange of capital and the rhetoric of righteousness. Be wrong. Your brother signed in, eh? Are we there? I don't see him. <clears throat> Tense and stutter like a leaf. Translate the sensibility of your mutable perceptions. Still the liminal space refusing brutal daily efficiency. Emotion derails production. You wept with the fishes and a poppy bloomed across the desk. What a thrill. The miniature temporality of rupture and the soft acceleration that follows. The flower bed is abundance and evidence yet never enough be enveloped in the cradle of their petals. Let the lyric fall apart and with it, the grief for all your lost possessions. Disperse among the leaves of the mulberry and across the East River, joining thinking to the low hanging sun. Cry out to what's dearest as the light sets your eyes to wake to swift habituation. Find reprieve in the sublime hideaway foliage of the rose bush at night. Let bitterness beam out to bounce back, shimmering its innermost intelligence. Do you see them? Touch into the depths of neglect to sweep the room. Yes, yeah, Sarah, that line was inspired from Raquel. Track your hardwired obedience and let attention fall away. That's what I'm talking about. If you find yourself listening too hard, just let your attention fall away. I do it all the time. Sway between chaos and discernment. Surrender is not a discipline. Give thanks to the body's insubordination and let it defy what you thought was understood. As you approach the closed gate, seeking some unknown satisfaction, sense the latch tremble at your touch. When it slams shut, do you? Turn to your field of permission and recover among its flowers. Palpate the axis for right perspective, like the length of the inner channel for traction. Acknowledge the loss of intimacies past to apprehend what is present. Coax the center. Evacuate the shock. 
Turn to alternations of light, dark, heat, cold, sound, silence. Attune your internal rhythms accordingly. Tap the pulse of your rage, it's disruption. No prescription for repair, no promises to deliver. No prevention of cyclical rupture. A glitch is a tear in the order is always already occurring. No temple in the wild, no saviors. No refuge but in a commons beyond and beneath, before and before. Do you betray your own integrity for fear of being left behind? I do. Refusing the tremble comes forth bursting. Cradle the point where the anger intensifies and give it permission. Enable the pain of the present to inflame and animate. The parts that I'm skipping over are images, but they're in black and white, so I'm not showing them to you. But from past videos. There is an iterative progression that transits mediums and fugitive slippage. Finding occasional traction in the passage between what's known and the vastness beyond. Attend to it and be held with the vigilance of cradling faith. Trepidation rises with the threat of machines whirring. Focus swerves by necessity. Through both contemplative labor and practical action, disrupt what is primed to fission. Activate the synthesis of your associative analysis. Investigate the data. Feel the wave beneath the wave, the whirl and swell. You decide to stay, hold the pain, and root down. What's wrong? Lightning strikes the mind and flashes waiting on the storm and the whir between sirens. Tennis in the empty court, combing a bee from her hair. Tell me what you know about power. Is it infectious? Is it blind? Does it choose you? Conflicting inner vision projects to the parallel present. Flash of daily missives, the rising pitch, the crowd like clouds and circles to disperse. The aggressor encroaches from all sides, tensing the strain of the dialect. Protect the inquisitive beating wings of your butterfly mind. Ask the windows from the news and cast your darkest judgments to the eclipse. To be right, safe. Truth is a discerning and permeable illumination. How do you know? Closely monitored, minute hostilities flicker and ignite. An invasion of the present blinds the screen. Devotion blanks under exposure. Collapse lost points of reference in isolation. Release occurs with spontaneous convulsion, silent incantations to invisible guides. Allow the body to sigh toward the moon. Never wrong. Pull back to the fore. It's been difficult. Weeks will pass years before the effects take root. In the meantime, you'll complain, feel the tide of individual failures that did not begin with you. Inherited mistrust will act through you with survival wisdom. And what is the pain you so readily brace against? Condition your body to get up against the edge of it. Dream deep into the night and see perception of multiplicities flourishing. There exists the dry, naked fact of living. 
transcribe its daily failures and progressions against a receding screen? How have you betrayed your divine task and service to the economy? Find the threshold where you can give the pain a little more space to do what it's doing. Keep it company. Stop making sense. The pressure elicits a rush of desire, so stunned, exhausted, but not enough to collapse. Permission appears ever distant in the swift cycle of neurosis waiting for the insight that'll fix the problem, the fixation on the problem. Observe the foreclosures enacted on your dream space when you try to retreat from the enshrined relations of the state. Give up. Find the soft, viable contortions that the body folds into so easily and recover the quality of touch that releases you. How has the complicity of your regard inflicted harm, fear, or judgment? Where have you assumed aggression? Where has your ignorance enacted neglect, invasion, displacement? Early summer heat swings the mind, subdues attention. Present is disquiet and simultaneous, an incidental seclusion of the intellect, the cipher of the calculation of self-protection in the average, fluctuating milieu of dailiness. Noise. The indiscriminate edges of sound, a volatile concern. What is the contingent threat between moods? What makes you fixate? Flash the temper, hold to the structure for safety. The mute light and the, and the fan worry. Be discerning with your obsessions if you can help it. Rest the recalcitrant mind and make space around your thinking. Take the ladder to the sky and look up. If you're not in awe, you're sleeping. Take stock of what's good. Chase the light to find the charge. There's an end point that will absorb you. Attend to the function of the wind in the trees, making it quiet and allowing space. This is the 19th of 25 pages. Does that sound okay? I can send it over. Okay. Claire, is that okay with you? I know asking that is like doesn't really give the option to say no, but I just wanted to check in. <sighs> Claim your discipline and see it through. Chaos is natural. Attend to what's at hand and get it down. It is not the work itself, but the anticipation of the task that breaks it. Holding down the perimeter is protecting the surround. The light on the leaves is overdetermined by the flare of the city. Intimation of a limit. How to measure fatigue, depletion, and what after. The high metabolizes and all you're left to reckon with is the terror of doubt. A rush to the heart to be surrounded. Plunge to rinse the fever and sleep in spells. Submit to the tide and steady the compass. Turning when swept and spent. The project drifts apart. What's happening in the quiet part? Clear. Situate yourself in the balance of duty, obedient to a relaxed diligence. Know your significance and your purpose. Be ready. You may be complicit in the unspoken pact of disregard. Change occurs, a pressure mounts, 
Be firm in your footing. Hold up your structure. Respond to the light as much as its negation. What do you refuse to let up? How do you choose depth in a small shell? Rehearse liberation through your language. But poems happen all the time without words. Deep, throbbing pain, trying to stay with its edges, radiating. Move the emphasis around until you find a sweet spot. What's intricately undone with the touch? What breaks past the skin? How will you let yourself want to live? The aliveness of the current moment has a pleasure even in suffering. I was in a ravine with a swarm. I closed my eyes and expanded the interior. There was a thrashing sound and when I looked up, it began to hum. Identify the distinction between the ambition and its social result. Listen in to assess what you're making of this life. Manifest the interior. Work the full. Choose whether or not to risk humiliation. Silent undercurrent speaks what you refuse. Try to identify your strivings. With which conventions will you align and from which will you knowingly diverge? They told us to come do the work. They said, let it go to your heart for a while. Ring the bell for those whose lives made yours possible. The compass spins to the sublime in all directions. Learn to sit still. Let perception dilate. Disruption is natural. Root into the locus of your creative power. How do you learn through devastation from the depths of your body? Find that erotic measure between the threshold and the chaos, edge to touch the leg. Thank you, Alicia. That was beautiful. Um, you can uh, read that work alongside the lovely images with which it's interspersed in the chaplet. Um, you can purchase the chaplet on our website and I encourage you to do so. It's a very beautiful object. Both of the chaplets we're publishing tonight are quite long by chaplet standards, um, which I think gives a, a, an interesting dimension to the to the chaplet itself, which has grown somewhat more substantial over the years um, in terms of its physical heft. Um, thank you, Alicia. I'm going to introduce Claire briefly now and then disappear again. Um, and again, in that doc that uh, Zoe shared, you can read along if you'd like. Uh, Claire DeVogue writes poems and studies in the PhD program in English literature at the CUNY Grad Center, where she focuses on medieval and contemporary poetry and poetics. She also repairs vintage furniture. Please welcome Claire. Get some castanets. <laughs> so unmuted here. Hi, everyone. Um, Thanks so much, Alicia. That was so good um, and lovely. It felt like sort of like the plant you were planning a very secure kind of architecture for living in in um, uncertain times. Uh, so I liked the experience a lot. Um, and thanks, James and um, everyone else, Zoe and uh, Belladonna, for making this happen. Um, I'm excited to be here. Uh, OK, so. Um, the chaplet that I put together um, is sort of uh, 
I think of it as a series of apocalypses or apocalypses, I don't know. Um, apocalypse, as probably a lot of people know, is the root of the word is about unveiling um, and revelation. Um, so not necessarily something that's about endings, but about um, big uh, unpredictable changes maybe. Um, and also it's a thing that I think is kind of bound up with language and with the lack of language, sort of with what happens when you come to the end of a rope made out of words and um, maybe there's some discovery at the end of it or maybe there's something else. Um, and uh, I don't know, these apocalypses are also sort of infected, I think, with the feeling of waiting, which I think we have probably all been experiencing a lot of this past year. Um, so I hope you guys can tolerate a bit more of that feeling um, while I speak. Um, okay. So this first apocalypse is about the question mark, I guess, and what it does to the voice um, and where a question resides in speech and, um, and therefore also, I think, sort of about potential and terror um, of the very small creatures that live in language and of the possibility of there being um, no question and no response. Um, and I've been thinking about making this apocalypse very long, like history, but I suspect that um, that might be a kind of torturous exercise, as you'll soon discover. Um, so, okay, here we go. Uh, interregnum. What is that, the pump room? Veto the ladder? Elevator or escalator? Is this politics sickness or vice versa? Halfway? All of it? Who's the politic one? Which floor do I dream that you are having a job um, working there just like you do in real life, manager? Should you have to apologize for being an investor continually, then what? What is an apology to an investor? What is it worth to, from, or for one? Or did you just live there? Or were you sorry for being born? Were you ever sorry or continually so? Or were you, were you just effortful, continually, in absence of sorrow? How many ways up are there? Shouldn't you apologize, though? What color is that on the final parallel where the ice comes apart? Remember when I dreamed I was sorting seashells made out of glass in a cold glass cabinet and knew that you were cutting a living man out of a cadaver? How have you been? What is happening on that floor with the light on all night? With the light on all night as you dreamed a baby as small as a teacup they had in the suburbs? Would it hide in the grass while the young lawyer mowed? Or had every art historian not tried to paint at least one painting? What was it you were wondering, the thing you were going to say? Or had every politician tried at least what once? Everyone is sometimes the politic one. Every wave is dealing silently with its own singular heft and song. Every man responsible to himself in the end. Can we all take another second on this one? The fires and imagine some point of difference a year from now when we might hide in yellow painless cloaks, take aspirin or something for our hearts and walk slowly thinking carefully about what has been done by them. The ones with the orange, with the present, with the simple terrible thing in the pocket. Can we take it up by hand, the little staircase, the chess piece, the iron? Or what is it that decorates with water like this continually, creator of all things, the pipe, the drum, the spigot? Or how could he not know which way this interrogation was tending? How fail to read such an old form which was like an orange rind that waited in the sand, merely contracting for so long after the fruit was eaten, which was like a hand that lacked the structure entirely to crush the object it held and yet tried and yet tried, squeezing, saying, so, this and that, and did you also, as you walked arm in arm along the foggy shore, you have such small feet, and be terrified and go slack? Who gets who? As if eventually I would have thought myself to wonder, was she not okay there in the gray sand? Like was the jellyfish doing something else as it lay there glinting? Were the seagulls in a line or just against the wind arrayed? Or else now what, a glass bottle? To do what with, stale? Or did you think this device stable? And by thinking so, think to solve it? Or did you think it corrupt? Did you, that anything finished with a yell? Remind me the six parts of any edible machine, the sun, the sin, the pipe. Tell me again how we came yelling off the docks for you a little too late. If you can hear me, think about waving or is that voice audible? Outline poem. You throw the ball very high and I am a kid playing with a green ball as the soldiers stand by. Everyone starts a cop and a child. Enough, ma'am, I do not understand. Drink the deracinated tea. Divide each word by 10, by 10 and 10. Sentences sprout in the dark. Box, X, 
The future sits with its mouth open very stupidly on a green coin with another question and the soldiers go by. They are laughing. The past is a mythic green grotto and the fish rhino human blood drips sibilantly from a laurel hung out to dry on the wire like a green question doily and the sun eats it. Evil is like that, funny in the end. I put this around my finger and Mercury keeps playing on the table and the satellite clusters and soldiers enough. This keeps me in a small window in the background. Each thing is in the round and each round grows soft blue and very small with diamonds, bricks, real selves and platitudes. The green needs are shooting from each fried corpse. I took it off that body. The discourse seethes so the rocks are difficult to see, pink froth and calf bones. My friend is brushing my leg. He takes my wet face in both hands. He pulls my hair to see if it is real. He puts his wet face on my face and screams, I am him, enough. I stand in the medical position to talk and sway. The talk like a black wave rose open black where the sea table had been. And the soldiers walk, shooting stars breeding spacesuits in silver foil and delicate acid etching stroke to plunder the silver seed then floating comet minnows peck out polyester eyes in the wash in the end. It is comfortable, expensive and unfair. Enough, I am full, go on. Dream. <clears throat> then you find a wallet with cash in it, some Korean, some USD, sticker moons and a photograph, an ID. Remember you are starving, so keep the cash. Later the world starts to shake very slightly at first, the blades of the leaves and things like a bad connection, then more. Some parts get very hot and burn, some cold or fill with water, some fall, we live at the end of one wing of a mall that is also a suburb in the world where people shop all day for fun. Next door, the Obamas or Bill Gates has a swimming pool. You don't. Your parents, Jamila, who are a child in this, a 1950s TV dad and lightsome blonde say they are getting a divorce because of the swimming pool. You are an honor student and win a prize. Reality is still ending. The Times. Some absolute approaches the meridian unique, the gold bar of dry grass at the center of what was swiftly becoming a swamp. Somewhere in a glass, the boys are always running around town looking for a missing treasure. Under each street light, each avenue and needle of silver tinsel, armed only with their wits to take on some crew or cabal, malicious, obtuse, greedy, bright, boys of the sixth age, the unreal one, the one that comes after reality ends, which is what is meant by this phrase, this resigned turn of the hand. The world it describes is contraband, a near miss, a project in missing the point of things. We might burn the records and crush the gems to powder, throw them into the Thames, and then what? Then what happens then happens then again? These strata were suspended in a chaotic abyss till chaos became the name of that road the sheep follow out of Tartarus, jangling. For us, it was all rock shows. Um, all right. This, I guess, is an apocalypse about turning um, to the left from where you are sitting, which I was actually right there when I wrote it, so that way, um, and left. There is a tube of something like butter and blue that rests on the lower hill between strands, orbs, and the cat is doing something else. Things cut off and float on rims of others, some you know by the shape of them, binoculars, and some shapes are, are how others, centuries, become separate, solid, take form from surroundings, cures, wars, the powerful sweeping down out of mountains or from the north on horseback or infernally, set into centuries of doing the same thing over again with no difference, whirling or dragging, hanging. Now the cat is doing something else, sitting darkly in angles, breathless, the hair of the back slightly raised, starlings take note, pause in thy awful plunging, pouring earthwards, deathless, through the gold units, through the white units with which all is decided, all finished for now, and the sharp quality of the heat units that stand still behind. I once read that almost every farmhouse in the Northeast at one time kept a copy of Inferno with the engravings by Doré. This is surely exaggeration, but did find one once in a wooden chest at a clean out near Syracuse in a red clabbered house that was coming down along with a farmer's diary bound in red leather. It was terse, the book, most of the entries having to do with weather, but for a week or more in late winter, 1887, each day read, shot a fox, shot a fox, shot a fox. And the point holds this kind of world having around a certain significance for that, with its doing of things in the fitting they have, how the hook fits the frame, 
the tongue, the premise, and how it seems then to summon itself wholly, more than even a fine system, totally, with the fox shape coming out of a dark area in the whitewash and being shot day after day, the earth turning over in damp agonies, the cut worm again signifying spring. Now the shape is almost too dark, it blurs. A lecture can be heard, archeologies of something or other, cremations, teeth of dogs. Um, this is also an apocalypse about turning to the left. So there's a theme here, uh, stack. Qualities being trickery fade, white beads, dinner, tagine, a hollow plate, the lace of the green sea after the ceramic shells, the certain smugness of the shell man saying, ceramic is hard enough for centuries. The divers, a bee in a ceramic vase. Inner points, scuffs, an IED three sheep, an art of cracking it and eating the flesh, staring solemnly at the white camera. Some people, displacement of vessels with the air bottled inside them, gracelessness at dinner, caselessness in the middle centuries, facelessness at night. You spend your days with an allegory of granite chipped from a silk skirt pressed by such and such a glacier with which you organize your time. You are blue, you are blue with it and roadside with candle shops, gas stations, stationery and antique malls, pizza shops, rams, reliquaries, an aspect of the real place in pencil or the white tissue paper used to blot the grease, some qualifications. Nothing is not made incompletely of what isn't. A day is nothing like a basket of rolls. A city is never the same, but a vertical fracture super minutely refracting among a moment that continues to recede and remains indifferent and never the same. A friend's child dies. The story declares itself gamely, a sequence of terms, awaiting interpretation, a series of tents, red, blue, yellow, and greenish gray, like a face sick on the waving of sea flags you saw in it, having swung perversely by your throat to the left, a series of tents in the desert silk, flags waving gamely. Oops, lost my spot. <laughs> Such a roll there. All right, uh, convocation. It is crisp on a fall morning. It is gone in a revolving door. Well, yes, the century is a very long date. We come to you on the shore, we know not where. Well, yes, the coral all has sex in an instant, releasing its spunk into the general ethos. A form rises out of the sea, is cut in two, becomes two forms in two seas, and each untangles her hair. Simple science, that administration that visits in all living things, bearing two jello salads, pop of copper color. Simplex is cut in two, becomes two colds on two poles, is stretched on a great wheel written into the will for pluralities to inherit by the lever's pole. Crest history, pull me forward. On the wall, there is a date. Above the date, there is a mirror. In the riverbed, wildcats are talking, chewing over issues, pledging a constancy that never quite coheres. Wet newspaper. All the stuff splitting the dark seams. Before it feels both good and bad to be so much in the know, then it's 2,000 years gone and there's nothing to it. You see the stuff corrodes so they can't read it. Us, traces of a huge city, or this global inclination, this hysteria in the parks with the lilacs weeping salt, silicon reason. Morning is still coming, larks, every day till the end of reality, Marie reports, the other one, where the sun finally replies, before all the stars in the sky go black like guttering candles, some New England patio, some buggy evening, reporting back time after it ends like shot, the volley and the gray stems, a black-eyed creature in later woods. That is, the Copernicans report by aggregate projection, this gutting, this glittering fact one might keep in the throat, piecemeal among the final bacterium of all but eternal life digestively, its burden repeating. Entire. The way, gray and long, but the snow was beautiful and the road black and gold. There is a whole other life that happened. It burst in red and light bizarre in February. I went up and down the stairs, which I knew where to put in the house that didn't exist. We would come to the shop at the bottom of the hill soon and stop. They've swept the floor when I get home. The TV is on, there is no TV. The other family suffers some absolute disaster falling asleep on the road after ages spent looking in our gold mirrors. Now their son has a hand he holds in a fist as he prays for 30K a year, God willing. In March, he wakes before dawn. 
Becky visits for lunch from the job at Dow Chemical, and a trust is kept in the chemical bank in love's tact. There is a second room in the basement and I didn't build it, in gold carpets, flowers and red, and chairs we use like shoulders for throwing a coat over. Kate shakes her head, there are things she can't say. They are in Florida, she moved on in August. Um, I feel like four more minutes here. Um, this is, I've been trying to be a completist, although it's not really my nature, and I'm trying to read all of Herman Melville <laughs> right now, um, which maybe feels or would seem a bit aside the point of the present moment, but I feel like it's giving me a fairly incisive vision of a certain American substrate that Melville is like mining or something um, and which remains structural and um, continues to shape whatever weird terrain I wake up into each morning. Um, and right now I've been reading his poems and his only published um, book of poems uh, published in his lifetime, which is called Battle Scenes and Aspects of the Civil War. Um, and this is a, uh, this is an apocalypse about some boots in that book. Um, it's called Or Aspect. He's in the next room putting on boots, factory boots. The boots grow bones, spurs in the trees, snapping the iron melts so in the land there is burning, oath taking and dying. Some walk before it to draw it as well as they can. The dome short circuits under the stone to foundry upriver from here. Others with the mystery go strange. We are waiting. 1382. Data freeze in cut frames, rolls burnt in the north next. Cousins by the bridge goes missing in the spring chewed open. Show us your insides and let us name the colors of your evil deeds. Below the death silks fluttering. We are full of breath and ravenous and a little comes. You are ingenious and quiet beside a stream of ready maids. The spring parts green from green. It wasn't the first time and a little comes. He who sat and asked her that she sit down naked and cross-legged with him and lock eyes. He who asked that they discourse naked by the eye, he who was losing it again. The spring is a mad time. The gardens neoclassical austerely wait outside Austerlitz by Avon. This operation is wasted, we're so over it. We want a pure moral form like a triangle, one that doesn't turn over like that when it comes. Drip, drip, drip. When something goes out a bit like a gesture in today, the most mundane kind of dream, one gets coffee, looks at a shell. Dog walkers in some green surf with their dogs walk distantly while this vent snaps like the ghost of our condo when the wind goes howling and has a post-it note. An hour is a steel measure. Then in the carrying of computers up and down some stairs, a weird kind of smell, spring perennials, and it is only the first month of the year. One should acknowledge the people with dogs bikes and coffee walking fast in a light spring rain. Do it only with the eyes. Everyone knows what that means. We are in love. Yes, it is plague time. I point out a fox. Why keep this prominently a painting so much the same as the view? Look out the window. Heaven, it seems, is something you must do over and over again, and that's fine, like a question that connects to another that's identical to itself in shiny primary colors called pleasure. Or maybe you hang out for a while in arrangement, Catholic and draining, waiting to catch your breath as the cosmos is compiled around you in the echo where it hadn't been before and the new glare, the flint congealing ionically into these flakes, forces and cones of forces. On the hillside cooling, we were naming our sun and all the conditions of blue chalk nested. Unlike animals lay down with each other that day, boosters for real life and it was real life and fine and finished, polished, plastic. Or let what happened before not be in this one, for it was wet and so fell to pieces. That's all, that's all I'll say. <laughs> I'm gonna buy some castanets for next time. Hi, thank you so much, Claire. That was, uh, so beautiful. I love it. I've, I love it every time I read it and listening to you read it in full is a real treat. Um, well, that's all. These things always snap shut so precipitously. Um, thank you so much to Alicia and Claire. Buy these chapbooks. Um, they're really 
something. Um, they're special. This this little duo, I think, is 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 unique in my mind. Um, and thank you to Zoe and Alma and Rebecca for your help on the production end. This can be quite harrowing. I don't know if any of you know what, it, what goes into putting on a Zoom reading, but um, I think I really am grateful to my uh, coworkers for their grace and endurance. <laughs> um, thank you all. Have a warm weekend. Enjoy the full moon. Um, be well, stay well, stay healthy. Uh, that's it. <laughs>